So, uh, hello everyone. It is my great, great pleasure to introduce to you a distinguished scholar and researcher, Dr. Derre. Dr. Derre is an assistant professor of psychiatry at Harvard Medical School and principal investigator of NIMH funded research. She has a multidisciplinary training in basic science, mental health, neuroimaging, including electrophysiology and genetics. She holds a master and PhD in biochemistry and experimental pathology from Boston University. Dr. Derry's interest is in understanding psychosis and other mental illnesses by looking at the genetic informing neural processes. Dr. Derry, thank you for being here and without further ado, I will let you take it from here. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Iraji, for the kind introduction. And uh, I am just today going to talk about uh, uh, the MIR-137 polygenic risk score for schizophrenia and the role of the MIR-137 in morphometry, specifically in the morphometry of lateral ventricle, ventricles and corpus callosum. And what you see here uh, uh, to your left is uh, the typical segmentation by free surfer of the brain and to the right, you see tractography, tractography of the corpus callosum. I will talk about this. At the bottom here, you see the structure of the micro RNA 137. And I will also talk about that. Now, um, I basically have no disclosures beside the fact that this research was funded da, by the NIMH to Tracy Patrician and uh, to me, and also uh, by Maastricht University to my colleague uh, and friend Gabriella Blockland. Basically, um, we all ask the same questions, and one is whether psychiatric illnesses can be imagined. And in particular, those of us that are interested in schizophrenia, um, we ask whether schizophrenia has some type of signature that can be recognized by studying the brain. All in all, the big question is whether mental illness has uh, some type of neurological, neurobiological substrate. And what you see here, I put the image of the first MRI in 1977 meaning that there are a few decades of research uh, in psychiatry that have involved morphometry. Uh, just to remind uh, all of us about the prevalence of uh, mental illness and why it's important to study it, uh, what you see here is data from the NIMH, I think it's 2019, and the overall prevalence of serious mental illness is more than 4%, 4.5%. Another interesting thing that I um, uh, want, want you to see here is that when you look at age cohorts, the highest prevalence in, is in younger people, people in between the age of 18 and 25. So I would say late teens, uh, mid 20s, um, and we know that this is a time that is particularly vulnerable, is a time of the brain undergoing uh, neurodevelopment still. Now, uh, this is another way to look at the same data, but in particular for schizophrenia, again, especially for males, you see the uh, rate for um, 100,000 people being highest in between the age of 20 and 24. And uh, again, it's important to uh, remember that when we look at the relative prevalence of schizophrenia, this is much higher than Alzheimer's disease, multiple sclerosis, uh, muscular dystrophy. So it's a real problem for society. Schizophrenia is a complex disease. This is a um, 
cartoon that I adapted from Lieberman, a paper published in 2001, and shows basically the trajectory as you can see on the x-axis, uh, the age trajectory from gestation and birth up to middle age and uh, older. Um, in the, on the y-axis, you see the transition between being healthy and at the bottom, um, the worsening of symptoms. The premorbid stage is followed by, um, I would say, a deterioration in symptomatology and functioning with the first onset of psychosis. Now, I want to say that our aim here to study schizophrenia, morphometry and uh, uh, genetics is to avoid that first episode, uh, episode break because we know that each time there is a, a psychotic break, the brain suffers and the deterioration becomes bigger. This is another way uh, to look at the at schizophrenia. This is a paper that uh, um, me and uh, Dr. Keshaman at Harvard just uh, published in Schizophrenia Research. And basically, it's also representing of a trajectory from, in this case, epigenetic factors, genetic risks up to the final consequences of the pathophysiology. Now, uh, in, in, during this talk, I'm going to focus on the genetic risk and, and, and on brain dysfunction. I will not talk about environmental factors that are super important and are also part of my studies, but we will just talk about genetic and brain dysfunction. So schizophrenia is a complex disease. There are a series of diverse um, symptoms. Uh, one of the important one uh, um, is con cognitive impairment because we know that cognitive impairment is um, transcends other symptomatology. And in general, people that are affected by schizophrenia have an IQ that is half a standard deviation to one standard deviation below the mean of the general population. Now, um, when we look at the different stages, we can focus on different type of tools to study those stages. And I'm gonna first talk about neuroimaging. Uh, historically, the lateral ventricles have been the first abnormality that has been the signature of schizophrenia. This is from the New England Journal of Medicine, 1992. And what you see to the right is an MRI scan that shows enlarged lateral ventricles. To the left is a comparison, a healthy control. And together with the enlarged lateral ventricles, there was also the um, isolation of the enlarged temporal horn of the lateral ventricles and also the third ventricle, even though they have neuro, different neurodevelopmental origins. A study in 2016 by the Enigma Consortium, uh, Van Erp was the first author, uh, was one of the first studies that looked at subcortical regions in a large cohort of individuals with schizophrenia and compared to healthy controls. And what you see here is Cohen's D as represented on the X uh, axis and different regions um, in the subcortical part of the brain. The hippocampus has um, a large Cohen's D, I would say, uh, in the negative with a negative uh, sign in front of it, meaning the hippocampus is decreased when you look at uh, so many individuals as in the um, Enigma Consortium, uh, the lateral ventricle is increased. And you can see here the positive sign uh, reaching almost uh, uh, 
I would say 0.4. So a nice effect size for the lateral ventricles. Now, we were interested in looking at the lateral ventricles and the corpus callosum. And the reason is that basically, when we look at the lateral ventricles and the corpus callosum, uh, we can see that not only the lateral ventricles is a signature abnormality in the brain, in the 90% of people uh, affected by schizophrenia, but the corpus callosum is also uh, affected in the majority of people. Now, the corpus callosum basically, um, especially in its central portion, portion um, represents and compose part of the wall of the lateral ventricle. And so our interest here was to understand whether really the corpus callosum and the lateral ventricle as intimately associated neuroanatomically um, are basically affected together in schizophrenia. What is interesting is that if you look at the literature, what you see is that the lateral ventricles and the corpus callosum are not affected only in schizophrenia, but in many neurodevelopmental syndromes, such as the P. Hopkins disease, in syndromes that involve the agenesis of the corpus callosum, and then the 22Q11 syndrome that basically has a high incidence of uh, schizophrenia associated with it. So our hypothesis was that corpus callosum and lateral ventricles, uh, their abnormalities are related to schizophrenia, but they are genetically determined. And uh, we started uh, by uh, doing a small study and uh, here, what I am going to do is start with uh, looking at the uh, pipeline that we follow to uh, basically perform our studies. And I'm going to start with neuroimaging and structural neuroimaging. We basically used FreeSurfer. And here you can see the Desigan Kiliani Atlas that uh, basically segment the brain in 34 regions in the left and in the right. And uh, um, on top of using FreeSurfer, we also developed um, new brain masking techniques that we call the MAPS. And these masking techniques we developed in order to make the FreeSurfer segmentation even better than the automatically produced FreeSurfer masking of the brain. Now, I remind you that masking is important in neuroimaging because it helps the computer basically distinguish between brain and non-brain. We used basically a training set that we manually masked. And according to this um, manual masking, we created an atlas, each target, each new neuroimaging MRI that we had was compared, um, was registered to the atlas, and we use a nonlinear transformation. Our results basically showed that we published in 2016, showed that our MAPS masking was doing a better job, we think, uh, than uh, uh, the free surfer or other uh, masking techniques. So we used masking techniques. And then we did our first small study uh, uh, comparing first episode schizophrenia and controls for lateral ventricles enlargement. In this study, basically, um, if you look at the left, we looked at controls, a baseline in black and gray, and the first episode schizophrenia in red and in orange and a baseline and follow up for not only enlargement at one point, but also uh, in time, but also uh, one year after uh, the first MRI. 
basically uh, what we saw was a significant enlargement of the lateral ventricles. This was through a baseline and it was maintained um, after one year uh, of uh, reassessment. We look at the volume of the corpus callosum and basically we saw an a decrease of the corpus callosum that was specific to the central corpus callosum that was of very much interest to us because it is the central corpus callosum that basically forms part of the wall of the lateral ventricles. The way we uh, segmented the corpus callosum was according to Hofer. So we um, distinguished an anterior and mid anterior, a central portion, a mid posterior, and the posterior portion of the corpus callosum. This is very similar to the segmentation carried out by Free Surfer, and I will talk later on of the tractography that we carried out uh, in, this, um, uh, in this study. Now, the sample for this study was pretty small. We had only 19 controls and 19 first cephalos schizophrenia. But we, beside the enlargement of the lateral ventricles and the decrease in the central corpus callosum, what we saw was an inverse relationship between the lateral ventricles volume and the central corpus callosum that was only present in people with psychosis. So this was a little bit of an assurance that our hypothesis was um, uh, okay. So after this study, we decided to look at diffusion measures of the corpus callosum and determine, as I show you here, determine whether uh, diffusion as a functional measure of um, the corpus callosum is also related and abnormal and related to the lateral ventricles. We carried out a two tensor uh, tractography. Again, we um, uh, choose the segmentation by Hofer. And as you can see here, the, the different portions of the corpus callosum, the, the, the largest one metal trapped in the brain, um, basically um, connecting the right and the left brain. Can the, here, the different tracks uh, going to from the anterior to the frontal in red and the posterior going to the posterior uh, part of the brain are well represented here in different colors. Um, so just to remind, if there are students here in the audience, the tractography is basically a 3D modeling technique. We basically model uh, white metal tracks um, by uh, analyzing diffusion weighted images that can be uh, collected by a special pipeline during acquisition of MRI. And what we look when we look at diffusion tensor imaging is basically the direction of water uh, we, and we look at three directions, lambda one, lambda two, and lambda three. They represent basically um, the movement of the water. The more you have a sphere, the more you have an isotropic, a random type of movement the more you have an elongated shape of, um, of this uh, representation of water, the more you have a direction. And there are different types of measures that we can uh, uh, use to determine uh, the diffusion in different tracks, the, the trace mean diffusivity, axial diffusivity, and fractional anisotropy. Basically, these measures represent uh, these vectors that are uh, representing the direction of water. Just a reminder that the FA is the most used uh, type of measure in diffusion, and it's a measure that is highly sensitive to microstructural changes. 
uh, of the uh, microstructural integrity of white matter. For this study, we use two types of tractography, as I was saying. This is a um, type of technique that was developed at the Psychiatry Neuroimaging Lab in Boston at the Brigham Woman by uh, Professor Rati. And uh, it's a good technique because it allows to follow the trajectory of white matter tracks, not only as a linear trajectory, but also when the white matter tracks um, basically bend or intersect one another, something that it's impossible to see with single, single tensor streamline. And the, you can see here how better the representation of the corpus callosum fibers is when you use two tensor tractography. Now, uh, this was also a small study and uh, here a representation of the results. So we are looking at uh, diffusion measures in first episode schizophrenia comparing to control. And if you look at the top left graph, what you see is the um, fractional an anisotropy typically decreased in first episode schizophrenia represented in red, very significantly so. The uh, top right represented radial diffusivity is also uh, significantly abnormal. In this case, we expect radial diffusivity to be increased. And trace is also increased. It's, this is something that we would expect. And uh, when we look at um, the trajectory of abnormalities in time, we see that uh, the abnormalities, especially in uh, fractional anisotropy, uh, continue to deteriorate in first episode schizophrenia, while there is no change in healthy controls. Now, our ultimate question was whether the functional um, measures, so FA, fractional anisotropy, uh, radial diffusivity that represented the, the movement, the functionality of the corpus callosum were also related to the lateral ventricle abnormalities. In red, what you see here is um, people affected by schizophrenia and in black people that are not affected. Basically, there is a strong significant correlation between both FA, uh, and RD with the lateral ventricle volume. The, I want to say that at the same time we, was, we were doing this study, LET published a paper that was looking also at lateral ventricles and found a similar uh, connection between the lateral ventricles and uh, diffusion measures of the corpus callosum. Now, the, the last question that we had was whether there was a genetic background um, to basically the lateral ventricles and the corpus callosum and their um, relationship. Just as a background, uh, we know that schizophrenia has high irritability. The high irritability has been shown largely uh, by twin and family studies. These are uh, classically, um, um, classical genetic studies. They are very important. The irritability is up to 80%. When you look at this type of family studies, we know that there is a missing irritability in schizophrenia. Part of it is um, has been, um, uh, is basically uh, due to the fact that when we look at irritability uh, by using GWAS, genome-wide uh, genome association studies, the irritability is much lower. And there are several reasons for this. Uh, one reason could be that the GWAS really is looking only at uh, the exons, uh, but there are other things that are going on in schizophrenia and other neurodevelopmental disorders 
epigenetic factors and of course the interaction between the environment and the genetics. And um, our approach was to look at the endophenotype and again our endophenotype uh, was the lateral ventricle and the corpus callosum and their ratio in order to look at the relation between the genes and this complex disease. So before we started to look at the genetics, we basically made sure that the lateral ventricles and the corpus callosum were indeed intermediate phenotypes. In order to have a good end of phenotype, you need to have some measure that is heritable a measure that is associated with illness in the population is not state dependent. So meaning that this type of measure is present in the individual, whether the illness is active or not. And uh, when we look at the irritability of the corpus callosum and the lateral ventricles, and this is a paper by my colleague uh, Blockland, Gabriella Blockland in Maastricht, what you see here is that the majority of measures, of morphometric measures in the brain are highly irritable. When we look at the corpus callosum and the lateral ventricles, not only Blockland, but other uh, tra more traditional studies before then um, have reported the um, irritability of the corpus callosum up to 90%. So a very heritable type of measure. The irritability of the volume of the ventricle has been reported by uh, different studies uh, up to 54%. Now, I want to remind that the lateral ventricles enlargement is really not specific only to schizophrenia. For example, if you look at, uh, there have been studies, men, uh, studies in men that are alcoholics, there you see a large um, abnormality uh, of the corpus of the uh, lateral ventricles. So, but our interest was specifically about the lateral ventricles in schizophrenia. Uh, another um, uh, thing I want to mention is that fractional anisotropy has also been uh, described as highly irritable. For carrying out the genetic portion of these studies, we turn to, gen to the genus consortium. Now, this consortium uh, was uh, basically funded uh, by Tracy Petrician. She had um, another one from the NIMH, and genus means uh, genetics of endophenotypes of neurofunction to understand schizophrenia. It was a collabor and is a collaborative uh, project, and um, it basically uh, differ from other types of uh, similar efforts because, for example, Enigma, because it uh, required people that participated in the consortium to provide the primary data. While we know that, for example, Enigma, that is an important effort, um, uses mostly summary uh, statistics. Uh, this is from a paper where we describe the genus consortium. In this case, the table is about the number of subjects, whether patients, these are basically all schizo people affected by schizophrenia controls, and we have a number of familial high risk subjects. Um, this is this small number so represents the data that we use for our genetic pro project in relation to lateral ventricle and corpus callosum because they had genetics and neuroimaging. Now, if the genus have up to 10,000 um, 
data on cognition, for example, but these were the data that had both neuroimaging, good neuroimaging, and uh, good genetic data. Basically, we had 1,000 cases with schizophrenia, 1,000 controls. Um, for the GWAS data, we relied on the, uh, basically, the PGC. And for looking at the uh, structural MRI, um, the effort was, as I was saying, that of uh, collecting the primary data from uh, 13 different sites and reprocess uh, the data. We adapted the pipeline for the uh, structural MRI and used the MAPS masking that we had developed uh, two years before to the reprocessing of the data. I want to say that some, I'm, I don't know who is in the audience, but many people that uh, uh, participated in the genus uh, might be here, uh, Professor Cahoon and Jessica Turner and many others. Some uh, of the people that participated didn't provide um, the primary data, but provided just a subset. And from that subset, we were able to um, determine whether summary statistic would be good enough to be included in the uh, study. Now, the primary genetic um, focus on the, of the study was on the MIR-137. And the reason is that the MIR-137 is a very, one of the strongest um, risk uh, factors, variants that have been uh, um, identified in uh, GWA studies. And uh, it's a small micro RNA. The most important thing for us was that it works in regulating other genes, so the level of other genes, and it works in neurodevelopment. In neurodevelopment, but also in adult uh, neural um, differentiation. And that neural differentiation that happens in the adult is pretty much um, restricted to the hippocampus and also the subventricular zone, so right below the lateral ventricles. So we thought that it could be, we hypothesized that it could be one important factor uh, in the genetics of the lateral ventricles and the corpus callosum. The other part is that uh, MIR-137 regulates gliogenesis, so the uh, development of white matter. And this is just to remind you, just after uh, conception, this is at 18 days, um, uh, you can already see the differentiation of the ectoderm and the neural plate, but at 20 days, you already see the neural groove. This or this yellow part that you see here is where the MIR-137 is active and regulating neurodevelopment. So really starting very early in neurodevelopment. Now, the um, MIR-137 regulates several genes that are significantly associated in GWAS with schizophrenia. So that's another point that makes MIR-137 particularly interesting. These are TCF4, the ZNF8048, the ankyrin gene, and the green 2 b So these are all very important schizophrenia-related genes. TCF4, on top of that, is also related with Pete Hopkins. And so, as I was telling you before, Pete Hopkins is also um, characterized by enlarged other ventricles and CCI population, so smaller uh, corpus callosum. So 
again of high interest to us. Uh, just to remind you what microRNA are, they are non-coding RNAs, they negatively regulate gene uh, trans transcription, they bind to the three prime and transcendent region of various genes, but they also directly bind the mRNA. So this is from uh, the Trends in Pharmacological Science, a paper uh, from 2016, and basically conceptualized in these cartoons the trajectory from microRNA that you see here on the top left to the effects on neuronal functions and plasticity in the adult. And here you can think about for example, people affected by uh, schizophrenia. The first thing we did uh, was to, for, for, for our own sanity, basically um, check the direction of abnormalities, sorry, in the genus, so in roughly uh, 2,000 people, the direction of uh, volumetric abnormalities in uh, people affected by schizophrenia in red and people that we consider healthy controls, they are not affected by uh, schizophrenia. And as you can see in the genus, what we see is what we expect. In particular, if you look at the bottom, the lateral ventricle is very highly significantly increased in cases, while if you look here at the top, the corpus callosum is, the volume is very significantly decreased in cases compared to controls. When we look at uh, and calculate a ratio here in, uh, uh, where I'm pointing with, mo by, uh, with my mouse between the corpus callosum and the lateral ventricles, the ratio is very much decreased in uh, schizophrenia. So basically, we are able to uh, confirm what we were expecting in this large data set, and we also are able to confirm the relationship between lateral ventricles and corpus callosum. Now, we were interested in looking at different, not only at the MIR-137 itself, but also at the pathways to understand which of the pathways that the MIR-137 regulates is really involved in uh, the corpus callosum and lateral ventricles and their ratio in schizophrenia. These are different pathways that we uh, basically uh, got from the literature. And I believe that some of the people might be in the audience that uh, discovered, that described these different uh, pathways. And uh, here you can see the uh, composition of these different pathways. We look at the uh, MIR-137 gene by itself, and then we use different um, stringency for the for increasing uh, number of uh, variants, and we look at the Efrim pathway, the long uh, uh, potentiation, the PKA, the axonal growth, and the MIR-137 targets that was described by Hill. We also looked at the uh, PGC polygenic score for uh, schizophrenia. Now, when we look at the associations, um, what we saw that the most interesting association was that one, the one uh, for the Efrin pathway. So what you see here is our different intermediate phenotypes uh, at the top, the CC anterior, the corpus callosum anterior, and so on up to the CC total, the lateral ventricles in the last uh, column, and then the different ratio, from, ratio 
between corpus callosum and lateral ventricles and the overall corpus callosum and lateral ventricle uh, ratio here in the next to the last columns. What you see uh, in the key in different colors is the different stringencies. So 5 times 10 to the minus 8 is represented in red, while 1 is in yellow. Whatever you see that uh, is an empty uh, circle is not significant, while the uh, circles that are colored are significant. And uh, what was interesting is that if you look at the beta for, for example, the lateral ventricles, you see a very significant genetic association with the Efrin pathway. Uh, in this case, at P uh, less than 0.05. And then in decrease in the ratio of the corpus callosum to the lateral ventricles, a different stringencies you see um, quite a significant association in uh, cases. Now, what are the efferents? The efferents are basically a receptor uh, tyrosine kinases. They are very important and they are very uh, abundant in the developing brain. Now, uh, they are essential for correct, correct brain formation. And uh, um, gene mutations are of uh, efferents are involved in many different uh, neurodevelopmental disorders, lysencephaly, so uh, very small um, um, cortical uh, cortex and uh, um, microgyria, heterotopia, but even in the Zika virus neurodevelopmental abnormalities, in particular, the development of small brain. So we were very happy finding this. We decided that another part of our studies um, would be to confirm that the lateral ventricles and the corpus callosus are indeed good um, intermediate phenotypes, not only them, but also the ratio of the corpus callosum to the lateral ventricles. That is what interests us uh, as a coexisting abnormalities in neurodevelopmental syn syndromes. Now, what you see here is the mega uh, irritability estimate uh, um, technology that was developed by uh, the smaller lab um, at uh, Harvard. And uh, basically what we see is that the irritability is basically very high for the uh, corpus callosum, especially the ant anterior uh, corpus callosum. Uh, it's very high for the lateral ventricles. Here we see uh, a 0.65 or 65%, but uh, the central corpus callosum to lateral ventricles irritability is basically the highest. And uh, this confirms our original hypothesis that the, there is a co-irritability of corpus callosum and lateral ventricles in uh, schizophrenia. So, uh, so these are novel data because they are based on GWAS and not on uh, traditional um, genetic studies, family and twin studies. We had demonstrated in our smaller previous studies that there was a relation between global functioning and the ratio of corpus callosum and lateral ventricles. So we were eager to see whether looking at a big data set, this would turn out to be true. So what you see here is basically a simple correlation between um, 
volumes and different measures, um, including clinical measures, for example, illness duration, the PANS, so the, uh, this is the scale uh, for negative positive symptoms. We also included the uh, chlorpromazine equivalent uh, as a measure of medication. We included the GAF, so this was what were of interest to us beside these other clinical measures, but also education level and um, pre-morbid IQ that uh, we measure with uh, verbal ability. And what we, and our intermediate phenotypes, uh, the morphometric measure, what we saw is that the ladder of ventricles is um, basically related to CPZ. So this was interesting. Uh, the higher the medication, the higher the chlorpromazine equivalent, so the higher the medication in this population. But we also saw a relation with the GAF. We saw a relation with the GAF uh, even stronger when we looked at the corpus callosum to lateral ventricles ratio. So significantly associated this ratio with the global functioning. And uh, I want to remind that basically when we talk about mental illness, we talk about functionality. As long as somebody is functional, it, they can be strange. But if they are fulfilling their role, they are good students, if they are students or they are good mothers, if they are mothers, we don't give them a diagnosis. So the functioning uh, um, is basically the uh, important definition of mental illness. So we were able to uh, confirm this relation with global functioning. Okay, I'm going to close by uh, with a summary and say that we had hypothesized that the corpus callosum and the lateral ventricles are not random abnormalities, they are related in schizophrenia. And we started with a very small studies. We look at um, um, morphometry in terms of structural MRI, we look at tractography, and we look at the relation between lateral ventricles and corpus callosum um, and show that there is a relation between the two, the two abnormalities and this is related to uh, functioning. By using the genus consortium, so a large data set, we were able to replicate this uh, abnormalities, uh, relationships in schizophrenia, but also look at the genetics. We had hypothesized the involvement of MIR-137 because it really is active in neurodevelopment and in the adult in the subventricular zone, so really close, really at the edge of the lateral ventricles and the corpus callosum, and we were able indeed to show that the MIR-137, the microRNA-137, is involved in uh, um, the corpus callosum and the lateral ventricles and their, re and their relationship and the efferent pathways that is directly regulated by the MIR-137. Also very interesting because the efferent pathways is also um, identified as a culprit in many other neurodevelopmental syndromes. And uh, I want to finish by saying that we are thankful to all the participants and the staff uh, for the genus and all the investigators. This study was started um, by Tracy Petrician that now is in the industry and by the late uh, Professor McCarley and Larry Seidman. They um, were really key in developing um, the consortium and I am going to close here and thank you my audience. Thank you. Thank you very much. We really appreciate it. So I have, you have a time for a few questions. If you have a question, you can uh, uh, share it in the chat. I... Oh. Uh, 
oh, they're okay. in the chat box. Or if you guys have any question, if you want to ask your own question, please let me know so I will unmute you. So the first question is from uh, Cyrus, uh, and he's asking, was your skull uh, stripping and brain segmentation software a processing step before the free surfer? So basically he's asking if you did those pre-processing and segmentation before free surfer or not. Yes. And if you did, how did it improve the free, uh, free surfer results? I can uh, share again. Basically, I'm gonna, if you don't mind, I'm gonna show you. Um, can you see my screen? Yes. So basically, with this technique, what we did, we go to, so, um, so this is published in a paper 2016. I can add the link to the um, to the chart. But if you look here, basically at the top, what you see is um, MRI uh, scans, and in uh, B, C, D, E, F. In green, you see the masking of these MRIs. Now, when you mask the brain, so when Free Surfer masks the brain, is basically telling the computer whatever is green is brain, whatever is not green is not brain. So don't include it in the calculations of volumes or cortical thickness or surface area. Here at the top, in the center here, you see uh, our segmentation with the maps. What you see in D, E, and F is other types of segmentations. In D is free surfer. And what you see here is that the uh, masking is uh, revealing uh, of defects in the masking of um, this segment of the segmentation. For example, here the mask is missing uh, part of the uh, posterior portion of the brain. So when the segmentation happens and you are using better masking, you are going to have a better um, evaluation of the brain volume. And so, um, I guess better results. Yeah. Uh, a follow up question from Cyrus. He's asking, uh, do you think that the morphological difference is caused by genetic and schizophrenia might be corrected by a good model of how healthy aging changes the morphology of the brain? So that's such a good question. Yes, age changes the morphology of the brain. So all the data are basically corrected for age uh, and also age square. Uh, I mean, we were very careful, but yes, of course. Thank you. Definitely. Uh, uh, the next question is from Matthew. Uh, she, uh, they are asking, would it be inaccurate to propose that schizophrenia is disconnection syndrome given the colossal involvement? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Definitely. And in fact, if you look at the corpus callosum, uh, the fact that there is an abnormality of the corpus callosum, not only in the volume, but also in the tractography, is telling about a disconnectivity syndrome. Yeah. We also see in the functional connectivity, of course. And the next question is from uh, Jean Liu. She's asking, is the corpus callosum uh, lateral ventricular ratio relationship with GAF specific to schizophrenia? If not, any plan to investigate general effect? I don't know. I really don't know, and that's such a good question, and we are basically working in another huge data set to understand whether this can be explored further behind schizophrenia. So, yeah, thanks Thank for you. the question. Uh, 
And uh, one more question for me. Uh, so at the beginning, you show there are the differences, the sex differences, like a more uh, male than female. And we see like uh, sex differences, even in our study, like we have a couple of the study looking at sex differences in functional connectivity. Uh, so considering the, those, have you looked at to see if these patterns that you see are specific to the specific gender, sex, or it is like common between them? That's such an important question. In this particular study, we did not see differences by sex, even though I, we thought we would see some differences, mm. but uh, we didn't. I, it, yeah, it's 14 hours. So, yep. Uh, so maybe we can stop here because we are right at two. Uh, I can uh, share the rest of the question in the Slack. So if anyone have any question, they can follow with the uh, in the Slack um, workspace. Thank you again, Dr. Delray. Delray we really appreciate your time. And Thank we you so much. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.